Great to be with you, Hamid. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I guess this is our place. You're so. the star Thank of the you. show. And uh, welcome, Ted Decker. Thank you so much for joining us from Atlanta today. So today, we're talking about groundbreakers, and we've seen this fantastic uh, introduction about all the exciting things that are, are going on. Let me begin with you, Ted, because Home Depot has been a groundbreaker since you were founded uh, 45 years ago, and it's now a huge, successful company, uh, number 20 on the Fortune 500. So. What are you doing now to reimagine Home Depot so that it continues on this cutting edge of innovation? Well, thank you for having me, Hamid. Again, sorry I couldn't be there in person, but this appears to be working. Um, Susie, thanks, thanks for hosting. And yeah, to talk about groundbreakers with Home Depot is just a joy, because 45 years ago, we had three amazing entrepreneurial founders in, in Bernie Marcus, Arthur Blank, and Ken Langone, and they disrupted an industry. They, they, they took traditional retail where, where certainly the hardware industry was getting product on, on a two-step basis through distribution. And when you think about retail, you think about assortment, value, um, and service, and most retailers can do two of those three things. You can get great product uh, and great service, but you're likely to pay for that. Or you're gonna get great assortment at great value, but you don't necessarily expect a lot of service. And the groundbreaking nature of Home Depot was the founders put all three of those components, assortment, value, and service, under one roof, a, a big box, 100 odd thousand square foot home improvement store, in massively disrupted an industry, and then over time increasingly went direct from manufacturer to the store in, in tremendous volume. So that was the huge groundbreaker. And you know, our job is, is to keep that, that machine going, continue to deliver that three-legged stool, but increasingly in a digitized world. So we, we call it interconnected retail, and we have to deliver that same assortment value in service, knowing that so many of our customers, well over half, start every purchase journey online. And as they engage with Home Depot through a project, generally you're not just going to Home Depot to buy an item, you're going to buy a suite of items, multiple trips perhaps as you work on a project. So there's an, a digital engagement element that we talk about being the fourth leg of the stool today. We're going to talk more about what you're doing at Home Depot. Let me turn to you, Hamid. You built Prologis from a real estate consulting business, and now it is the world's biggest real estate investment uh, company. And you just marked an important milestone, the 40-year uh, anniversary. So congratulations on that. But uh, tell everybody here now, what are you doing to continue to evolve and to innovate? Great. Well, uh, it's. Uh, I just noticed Doug Abbey um, sitting in the, one of the front rows. He was one of my co-founders with, uh, along with Bob Burke, 40 years ago. And I see some of our old par partners, which is great to have him here. So I would say the same thing we were doing before. The first five or ten years of the business, we really didn't have a clue what was going on. There was no institutional real estate business. There were no global logistic companies. So we kind of wrote the playbook as we as time went along. Uh, but the principles were always the same. The principles were to stay curious, see what the customers are telling you, react to that, don't be afraid to take chances on new things. Um, don't take the word that it's never been done. Take that always as a challenge, and maybe more so. And sometimes you get it right, and many times you don't get it right, but eventually, if you get more of it right than wrong, uh, you have a pretty successful business. Well, you both talk about the importance of the customer being customer centric. And, uh, you know, we've seen, Ted, what you said, this dramatic shift away from bricks and mortar to online. You told investors recently that more than three billion people go to your uh, website every year, which is more than the number of people uh, walking through your store. So that's just amazing. And, Hami, customer demand has been so important to you because customers are demanding that they get their goods on their doorstep as soon as possible. So you've had a massive expansion of Prologis facilities all around the country. But I'd like to ask you both, what's the next big move? Is it still going to be focused on the customer? We know the power of e-commerce. But is the next big move going to be something else? Ted? 
Well, but before we get into, you know, assets and investments, you know, for Home Depot and Hamid just said it, it's always the customer. The, the customer is always first. When I talked about the fourth leg of the stool being a digital engagement, the customer took us there. And Home Depot has always valued the customer. One of our, our management principles here is what we call the inverted pyramid. When you think of most um, management structures or the armed forces, it's literally a pyramid where you maybe have the, the frontline associates or, or the troops, if you will, at the bottom, and you go up through layers of management and the senior management team, the CEO would be at the top of that. Our founders inverted that to talk about the power of the customer in, in a management principle of servant leadership. And at, at the very top of the inverted pyramid is the customer. And right below the customer are our frontline associates. Then you get you know, your layers of management at the very bottom is the executive management team and the CEO. So our job at the store support center, we're not a headquarters, our job at the store support center is to support the associates so they can support the customer and always let the customer lead where they're going. And, and clearly in our world, that customer is, is redefining convenience in terms of delivery and re redefining um, how they're obtaining know-how or the way they want to engage with the company on various digital platforms, whether it be our, our app or our, our other mobile properties. So we're going to listen to the customer and you know, not just invent you know, whiz-bang uh, solutions for our own satisfaction, but is there a customer signal? Do we, do we put in you know, various um, beta tests? To, did, did we hear them the right way? Did we, we build what we thought we heard they wanted and then, and then scale out to, to satisfy that customer desire um, as we get the appropriate signals? Your thoughts on this, Hanny, looking into the future, the role of the customer, or do you see some other driving force out there? Well, the customer is, um, is a little different in the real estate business. If you had used the word customer 30 years ago in the context of a real estate company, people would have just sh shaken their heads because they were called tenants. And they were called people that you make a deal with, you hire a nasty lawyer, you negotiate for <laughs> two weeks. You sign a lease, and then you ignore them for five or 10 years, and then you repeat the process. Um, clearly, in our type of business, where you have a logistics network, the customer is very different than, than a professional firm that may need an office downtown in the corner of Maine and Maine. You are bringing an entire network to bear um, on, on that customer's needs, and you're becoming a partner to them to help them grow strategically. So the network all of a sudden becomes much more important. So our big aha was transitioning from a deal-driven business to a customer-centric business. And you've got and big customers besides Home Depot, Amazon, uh, UPS, FedEx, big, big companies. Well, about 3% of global GDP uh, goes through our buildings around the world. So it would be pretty hard for somebody of any stature not to be our customer. Uh, so yeah, we're fortunate to have a lot of great customers. Home Depot is actually our number two customer in terms of size. And um, our relationship, uh, our companies touch one another at many different levels. And increasingly, given what we're doing with the business, it's no longer just at the real estate level. Mm -hmm. We're now collaborating with these customers on the innovation uh, level, on the venture level, and, uh, and now increasingly, at, um, we're learning a lot of things about AI and how we can help them with that and meeting all other needs that they have. For example, energy, mobility, and all the, all the other services that they need to take advantage of to be able to operate in our facilities. Okay, so you just mentioned AI. You read my mind, you know, where does AI fit in to this new future? And, and you, you saw the, uh, the video, it's all about AI, how revolutionary it is, how it's uh, changing everything. We have a lot of AI experts in the audience, so they want to hear from you guys on what you're doing. Ted, we've seen the progression of data analytics and AI tools at Home Depot. Uh, give us an example of what Home Depot is doing with AI artificial intelligence. Sure, first, first let me just emphasize that partnership that, that Hamid talked about. We, we couldn't be happier, Hamid, with, with the partnership with you all. You're just a, a massive partner with us. I know we have several very, very large projects going on right now, and it, it isn't transactional anymore. It, it's very much a partnership. 
and, and we appreciate that so much. On, on AI, Susie, as you said, th this is an evolution. On, on one hand, you can say, well, AI and generative AI is, you know, overblown. It, it's just the, the next phase of an evolution of, of, of data capture. Uh, I'll circle back to that. I don't think that's the case. I think this is a disproportionate advancement and certainly with, with the, the advent of the natural language models that, that power AI. But, but for us data, you know, we've been on a 45 year journey on data. And I'd say early days, we might've been a bit behind retail in general. And now I, I'd say we're on, on the cutting edge of retail. And, and for us, it was a matter of of collecting data, of getting data into appropriate data warehouse management systems, of getting business um, uh, management tools to be able to mine that data and gain insight. Um, but now, as we move into learning models and computer vision and, and, and how we're powering that, um, so many different areas. I mean, you think of our our search. You mentioned you know the three three and a half billion visits we have to our websites people are are using a home depot proprietary search bar um we have to understand their intent and, and we have to provide relevancy of the search results that's all ai driven home depot has scores now of, of phds in in data science and as as visionary as the founders were 45 years ago they were probably unlikely to think that there would be PhDs in data science um, at the store support center here in Atlanta. So we're using it for search. We're using it for a customer care operations. We're using it to, to power bot interactions with, with customer queries. We're using it for marketing and marketing personalization and one-on-one -on -one contacts with, with email in, in, in text. We're using it in our inventory forecasting and in replenishment systems. The, the opportunities are endless in the, the power and the magnification of what you can do with that data now is, is truly at an inflection point that um, I, I don't I, I think many of us are still very much in the exploration in, in testing phase. The deployment of these technologies over the next three, five, 10 years are, are just going to be extraordinary. A lot of people may be surprised, even the, uh, the AI specialists here, about how much Home Depot is doing with AI. And you mentioned that who you have on your the data scientists and engineers and all of that on your staff. How hard is it for you to attract that talent to Home Depot? Or would you say that you know many of them are more uh, attracted to places like Amazon or Google or SpaceX? I mean, what do you have to do to get them to work for you? Well, yeah, we're probably not the first place, um, a home improvement retailer for, for someone getting a PhD in, in data science. But, but when you, one of the things data scientists really enjoy in, in engineers, computer engineers as well, is massive, complex, difficult, scaled problems. That's what really, you know, we find interests these folks and, and when we get an opportunity to tell our story and talk about the scale of the data sets, the, the scale of, of the inventory, the scope of the business, um, we, we have a, a great hit rate. We're also very blessed to have Georgia Tech um, just down the street from us, clearly a, a leading uh, institution educating um, data scientists and, and computer engineers. So once we get our story out, um, we we don't have a problem. But you know, clearly, we're not uh, we're not as sexy maybe as SpaceX. Well, you know, you two are kind of on the cutting edge of embracing um, AI. There are many. Uh, business people who are trying to figure out how to use AI, you know, whether they want to do the spend, um, and they're watching and they're waiting. What do you say to those people um, that are that are on the fence? Yeah, I don't think you can be on the fence on this issue. I think it's a big, fast-moving train, and and you better get on it, or you're going to get run over by it. Mm -hmm. So, a um, couple of things about AI. First of all, AI is not new. I mean, uh, when I was in engineering school, I actually took a course in AI, 
and that was in, I was class in 1977, so that's a long time ago. But they didn't call it AI back then, They right? called it AI, then it became really a bad word, and they switched to expert systems. Anybody remember expert systems? <laughs> and now it's back to AI. So AI is new, not new. This chat GPT specifically, and the large lang language models, took the idea that was well known in, in these fields, and took it retail. So now everybody knows about, um, yeah. about AI. So that's what's really changed. But before you can engage um, with AI and get value out of it, you have to have data. And you have to have data digitalized so, or digitized. So without data, AI is useless. As companies have an advantage, companies like TED's, ours, that they have massive amounts right. of data. But most of them, especially in real estate companies, are not organized enough to have digitized it. So that's the first step that we've gone through. And it takes a huge shift in culture because you've got to explain to your people, why are you collecting all this information? Mm -hmm. Because you yet haven't shown them how AI can help their business. But fundamentally, the framework I, I use to think about AI is that it has three applications. Okay, one is using AI to do all the things we're already doing, but better, more efficiently. Mm -hmm. To me, that's okay, that's interesting, but that's not where the big prize is. The big prize is in uh, uh, items number two and number three. Item number two is using AI to make better decisions. What are the big decisions we make? What do we charge for a lease? How long the lease we sign? Basically, all the decisions that go around leasing with customers. Now we're using a lot of AI to drive those, uh, those decisions. What else do we do? We decide to deploy massive amounts of capital ahead of our customers' needs to make sure we're there when they need the facility. That means we need to figure out where to site some of these buildings. That means we need to learn how to put EV chargers ahead of the need in those facilities. So capital deployment and where we invest our money is a very big opportunity for AI in, in our business. And finally, the third, it's a customer engagement tool. I mean, everybody's gonna be doing this, and a lot of the small, not everybody's Home Depot with the resources of Home Depot. Mm -hmm. the long, in fact, our largest 20 customers, 25 customers account for 20% of our business. There's a very long tail of smaller companies that don't have the sophistication and the resources to be able to do this stuff, mm -hmm. but, but they look to us to help them to do that. So, uh, so I can go on for this for, for hours, but I think it's, a, it's an... So the message that we've been hearing from a lot of people, embrace AI or you're gonna be left behind. So, you're, I think so. you believe that? I totally believe that, and I, it's, I would have said the same thing to you in 1998 <laughs> about the internet, or 97 about the yeah. internet, or actually 99 about e-commerce. Uh, I mean, the reason that we got out of the retail shopping center business is because we saw the vision of the future when it came to e-commerce and its effect on normal retail and its effect on the logistics side of retail. Uh, which is uh, which can really help e-commerce companies. So, so, so yeah, I mean, you've painted a, a very good picture of where we are now and where we're going. And I just like, uh, we're, there's so much to talk about AI, but let me just ask you this, Ted. There's so many possibilities, uh, and you can dazzle us with things that you're thinking for years ahead. But what do you want Home Depot to be two, three, four, five years from now? How will we be describing your company? Well, I, I couldn't agree more, first of all, on the, on the need for the data. So to, to collect all the data, which, which we have loads of, and then make it accessible, and, and certainly with cloud computing, that, that's a, another big piece of, of what's powered AI is the, the data sets now are accessible. You know, you're not, you're not, pinging, you're not pinging a mainframe, you're not, you're not tying your software to, to hardware. You, you get the data democratized is in the cloud and, and so all areas of the business can mine it with, with their various queries and, and build models. You know, for Home Depot, I think we, we have a, an, an efficiency and in a, in a, in a, a virtuous cycle of, of productivity. And I, and I agree with Hamid, you know, the first thing is to do what we do better. So an example of that would be inventory. All retailers, the, the age old um, need of, of a retailer is customer service starts with an on-shelf availability at least in the physical world or, or, or even the e-commerce world. If you don't have it in your DC, 
you can't ship it um, to satisfy a customer order. So AI is going to help us do what we always do, striving to get you know better on-shelf availability, higher in stocks. You can just imagine that the data sets in, in, in the expert system models that we could could build in our in our forecasting algorithms will be better and better and better. But we are we are a mass retailer. We've always been an anonymous mass retailer. What we are increasingly being known for is that we will be mass personalization. So where where you used to be able to say, well, let's do an email campaign and let's do propensity models of, of likelihood to buy a grill, for example. And we might have X drivers of that and have four or five different audience sets to send out some sort of marketing contact um, on someone who we believe has a propensity to, to buy a grill. We can over time, I mean, th this may might be you know unrealistic in the next few years, but there'll be a time we have 80 million odd customers, we could have 80 million propensity models. We could know exactly when you, Susie, when you, Hamid, are the highest likelihood to be in the market for a grill. And we can hit you personally with a message. And not only a grill, do you like to smoke? Do you like to cook with charcoal? Do you like pellet grills? Do you like gas grills? That is what is coming at scale where you can take mass anonymous to mass personalization. You were gonna say when I said, what are you gonna be two, three, four years from now? It's not just a retailer, but you're gonna be a technology company. Isn't that what you're describing? Every, every, every company has to be a technology company and a data company and increasingly a data science company. I'd love to stay on this topic. Uh, we gotta keep moving. I see the clock uh, getting ahead of us here. We wanna talk a little bit about sustainability. Um, you know, we have two panels coming up. They're going to talk a lot about this. But you guys are um, leaders when it comes to sustainability. You have been, Hamid, very aggressive about installing solar roof panels. I think you're one of the biggest um, roof, uh, solar roof panel installers in the country. Uh, you've also been expanding the number of charging uh, stations for EV uh, vehicles. Tell us about the, the progress that you're making and what else are you planning on sustainability? Yeah, so if you look at buildings, construction of buildings, and then the energy used by buildings and the transportation element, which is very important in logistics, that accounts for about half the greenhouse ga gases. So we have a real opportunity to actually address a global problem while serving our customers who are getting pushed in that direction by their customers, and many of them don't have the resources to do it on their own. Again, Home Depot can do that really well. Amazon can do that really well. But your average 100,000 square foot customer in a warehouse somewhere can't really do that. So we have the ability to bring that knowledge and that expertise to those smaller customers and really help them meet the requirements that are being placed on them. I, the reason we do it is pretty simple. We think it's a really good business. I mean, we do it not to get um, you know, points or go to heaven or whatever. We do it because we can make money doing it and it serves a real purpose for our customers and it creates more stickiness. Mm -hmm. If somebody has a choice between going to space A and space B, a landlord that can actually provide them not with the four uh, walls and a roof, but also take care of their renewable energy needs mm -hmm. and sell them energy at an appropriate cost and have in the back of the building some places where they can plug, plug in their emerging EV uh, van fleet, for example, those are ways that we connect with the customers at multiple levels and create stickiness in those relationships. Well, let's get Ted in on this. As a customer, uh, how are you using these special perks at uh, ProLogis uh, warehouses? I mean, are your delivery trucks uh, charging up at those EV stations? And what more would you like Hammy to do? Well, we're, we have two major projects right now where we're, we're putting solar panels on, on the roofs of million plus square square foot distribution facilities. Um, we, we've always been been conscious of you know, what we're we're calling ESG. E, ESG is an opportunity for Home Depot really to be forced to talk about what we've always done. And we, we've tried to be modest um, in, in not toot our own horn. But when you have to, to publish, you know, what you're doing, it gives us a chance to to talk about it in, in, in one of our values that the, the, the guides our decisions, 
you'll see on all our aprons in the stores, we have a values wheel. We have eight values. And, and one of those is doing the right thing. And, you know, whether you're going to profit from it or not, I, I think pretty much everyone would would say, you know, belching carbon in into the atmosphere isn't necessarily doing the right thing. So we we have always been been focused on on responsible sourcing, whether that's, you know, certified wood forestry and old growth forests, whether that's getting, you know, neonics out of out of our live goods, whether that's getting formaldehyde out of our flooring materials in certainly reducing our own carbon footprint it, as much as we've grown over the last several years by installing um, solar panels, by transitioning all our, our lighting in our store to LED lighting, we've lowered our carbon footprint by 50% as we've more or less doubled the business over the past several years. Um, we have a long way to go and the, the biggest impact we can make is in the products we sell to our customers, as big as our footprint is, it's the the use of our product and uh, to our customer base is where we can have a huge impact. So whether that's getting ahead in, in being a water sense player, uh, you know, reducing water usage and plumbing products, um, certainly LED lights that we that we've transitioned completely in our stores for sale to our customers. And the, the greatest uh, wave right now in terms of, of carbon footprint reduction in the products we sell is the transition of corded and gas powered power tools and outdoor power equipment to battery powered technology. And we, we've made a, a couple uh, targets now where, where we will reduce our outdoor power equipment gas uh, sales by 85% in the next several years and we've begun to set um, scope three target um, uh, emission reductions on products we sell that from today we'd reduce uh, the emissions on scope three by 25%. So we're focused on this and, and again, as, as much as we can reduce our own footprint, it's the products we sell in the close collaboration with our supplier partners, whether it's electrical use, um, you know, uh, chemicals in, in, in pesticides that are harmful, and then ultimately, you know, cordless eliminating the small combustion engine, which is one of the, the single largest polluters is a, is a single combustion, small single combustion engine. That's just great, everything that you're doing there. It'd be great if we could see more companies, big and small, doing this sort of thing. Um, Let's move on to 2024. Uh, now that it's almost October, everyone's looking ahead. Um, Hamid, how is 2024 shaping up for Prologis? I think we're going to have a really good year. Uh, I think um, we are fortunate that we've had a very strong market in the last four or five years. And, uh, and as a result, rents are substantially higher in the market than they are in our portfolio. Mm -hmm. So that spread between where our rents are and when the market is, is an opportunity for us to continue to grow uh, for a decade uh, at, at, uh, at uh, really high rates. That gives us the opportunity to build these additional businesses that we're building. The energy business, the mobility business, the operations and essentials businesses, those are engines of growth that are kicking in and they'll really kick in as we capture this upside in rent. So I feel really optimistic about uh, the future and I think we're going to be known as more of a logistic solution provider than just a real estate company. Real estate is the foundation and the bedrock of our business and that's where it all starts. But I think with all these additional things, we're going to meet more and more needs of our customers so they don't have to go anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And frankly, that yeah. enables, and the data that comes with our scale enables us to recognize those needs maybe a little quicker and to position ourselves ahead of those opportunities. Are, are you just as optimistic, Ted? I mean, what are, what are, what are you expecting for 2024 in terms of overall business, but also uh, consumer demand? Uh, you know, I, every time I go to Home Depot, and I do go a lot, uh, the checkout lines are long, uh, the carts are full, and full of big, bulky items. So what is the uh, sense you're getting on the demand from the do-it-yourself consumer, but also from the pros, from the contractors, and what is that telling you about home building and construction? Yeah, I, I think the, the, the 
biggest surprise for, for consumer-oriented businesses this entire year is just how resilient the consumer has been. The, the consumer has been unbelievably resilient in, in the spend is measured by personal consumption expenditures, PCE, has surprised everyone. It, it, it's, it's what's driven the, the GDP growth uh, much higher than, than people forecast at the beginning of the year. It's what's driving people now to, to say, maybe there isn't a recession uh, um, maybe it's not a question of a hard landing or soft landing, you know, maybe there isn't a recession at all. So the consumer has remained incredibly resilient. We benefited so much from, from the, the cycle during, during COVID where people were spending more time at home and we, we saw in, incredible sales growth over, over 2021, 22, where we grew over 40%, $47 billion profits went up 60 plus percent. So we said for us, while the consumer is strong this year, we knew that there would be a shift in PCE spending from goods into services. And, and within goods, there were certain sectors that benefited more than others in that consumption. Certainly people staying at home um, were spending more on their home. So this year is, is a slightly down year for us, but you know our, our view on, on the medium and long-term couldn't be stronger. The, the housing stock, we have a fundamental <clears throat> shortage of housing in the United States. People put it between two and four million units. That's what, what's keeping our home prices higher, even with higher mortgage rates, because we just have a fundamental shortage of housing. Those houses are aging. And while people have, have gone back to work, you're still seeing more work from home. So you have more wear and tear on the house. So. We have a huge market. We think our TAM is something like $950 billion. And in the homeowner, you know, tends to have a great job and you know, wages have, have been strong. Unemployment's at record lows. So we feel really good about the consumer. We feel great about our sector. We're in a little period of digestion and, and moderation that, that we, we've communicated to, to our investors. But we know this is just such an incredibly strong sector and the things that we're doing to, to maintain our number one position in the market and things we're doing in supply chain in particular, partnering with Hamid and, and Prologis is gonna, gonna keep us number one in, in this sector. Great to hear such an upbeat uh, report, and you were saying the same thing. And you know, this past year, you've uh, done amazing acquisitions. You've been buying multi-billion-dollar uh, properties from the likes of Blackstone. Do you see doing more of that kind of investment in 2024? Yeah, we're we've got a great balance sheet, and we've built that balance sheet for times like this when capital markets are getting tighter and opportunities. Uh, uh, competitively are getting a little bit easier for us in that respect. So we do expect to have a very active year. Um, we're very careful about capital allocation decisions, and but we're not afraid to step in and uh, grow our business when we think the opportunities are there, and we'll do that. Uh, but I think the vast majority of our growth is going to be organic, not through acquisitions. So we just don't want to get bigger. We want to get better, and we're going to get more profitable. And the only way we're going to do that is to meet more and more needs of the same customer group that's now leasing space from us. They can be doing other things with us. So that's really where the focus and the energy of the company is, and I'm really optimistic. One of the things that happened as a result of this run-up in 21 and 22, which we all kind of were pleasantly surprised by, is that there was an expectation, at least on our part, that things would moderate. Uh, particularly the percentage of e-commerce would drop a little bit and then off, uh, start growing off a higher base than it was mm -hmm. pre-pandemic. Never really seen that drop off. So it's just kept powering on, just like Ted says, the consumer is in good shape. Now, let me add a personal editorial, and I'm not an economist, and you know, forecasting is a tough business, but I think the Fed's getting a little carried away. And p not so much with just the rates, but also with the with the language that they're using. And I think they could really spook this market into, into places that they don't want to go. But uh, we'll leave that to people who are smarter Well, but than we that. are also hearing from policymakers things that um, the economy is normalizing, that uh, supply and demand are coming more um, even, and that the supply chain problems are behind us. And I wanted to actually pick up from both of you, is the supply chain 
problems solved, or are we still vulnerable to that kind of uh, disruption? Both of you, Ted, Hamid. Ted, you go first. Well, I, I would say we're still susceptible, and a lot of companies are, are spending a lot of time on their supply chain resiliency and their in their sourcing resiliency, whether it's you know single source uh, domestically or internationally, the number of carriers you use, et cetera. So. I think there's a, a massive wake up call for the need of resiliency because who knows what that next black swan event may be. In terms of the operating global supply chains, we're pretty darn close to normalized. I mean, your your ocean freight, your your dwell times on ports, your your end to end cycle times of order to, to delivery that has largely uh, returned to, to pre-COVID levels. Your rates have certainly normalized in you know, astronomical ocean rates, for example, those, those have essentially normalized to, to pre-COVID levels. Same with domestic transportation, the shorter term spike in, in oil and gas prices aside, we're essentially through it. Um, retailers in general though, I mean, once you bullwhip a supply chain, recovery from that bullwhip is not an overnight dynamic. So you hear the term destocking in retail. It, it, it's just a matter of, you know, getting, you know, the, 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 the product, the, the product we have in places that is the most effective, you know, just get that, you know, you know, through the, through the snake, as they say, um, and, and get the bullwhip sorted out. And, and we're, we're, a long way on our way to, to finishing that work as well. But the, the current orders, the current flow, pretty much back to normal. It, I see, saw you nodding your head as Ted was saying all that. You seem to be agreeing. Is the supply chain, are, have new systems been installed or new logistics so that we don't get that kind of disruption again? Uh, quite the opposite. Um, I, I agree with everything Ted said, and you may remember two years ago when we had Carol Tome, Ted's old colleague here, um, uh, and we were having this interview, you asked me the same question, is a supply chain problem over? And I said, no, it's not over, and it won't be over in 21, and it won't be over in 22. It's going to take longer. Well, we are longer, and things have stabilized. But we are one earthquake, one crisis, one pandemic, one weather event away from the supply chain blowing up again on us. Maybe not to the same extent as, uh, as it did during the pandemic, but supply chains for a long time were run by, for efficiency. They were run very tightly because carrying inventory doesn't make anybody any money. But Ted said the most important thing, missing sales is the biggest sin for a retailer. So the companies are always at the verge of deciding, am I carrying too much inventory or not enough inventory? And I think that balance will tilt over time as we live in a less certain world to more inventory. So, because losing sales is, uh, is much worse than maybe paying a little bit mm -hmm. more for carrying the inventory. So I think there's a tendency to build more safety in the supply chain. I think after a couple of calm years, people will revert to their old bad habits of very tight supply <laughs> chains, and then it will blow up again, and we start the cycle again. So, so I, but I think generally there's going to be a trend and, towards higher inventory. And I'll ask you this question again next year when we do groundbreaking. That would okay? be great, <laughs> assuming that I'm still around. <laughs> All right, we just have about five minutes left, and I do want to talk to both of you to wrap up talking about leadership, because after all, leadership is what's driving all of our discussion about change and innovation and uh, stuff like that. Ted, given all the issues that uh, we've been talking about, how do you describe the way that you're leading Home Depot? You've been the new CEO for the past two years. Well, we, we talk a lot about, you know, run the business and change the business, and in running any business, you know, is a lot of work in, in, in detailed management. Retail in particular, you know, we say retail is detail. It's a, it's a highly operational, detailed, granular, focused business that requires an immense um, amount of effort. And, and Home Depot has been blessed for, for years and years of having just, you know, world-class operators and running a world-class retail business. But then you have to, you have to chew gum and, and, and walk at the same time. And you have to accept the change that is inevitable that the market is forcing on you and the change you want to 
to um, you know invoke on the market. And we're we're transforming um, our supply chain again with 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 the help of Hamid and, and his company. We're transforming how we engage with our customers. We you mentioned earlier we have a very strong pro business as well as consumer business. We're transforming our, our engagement models and our capability sets to capture more share of the pros larger purchase. So what what we have to do is is set the vision, get the alignment, not trip and miss a beat on on the operations of running the business, but at the same time, make sure we're making the appropriate investments and capital allocation and human resource allocations to to capture the future as well. Let me ask it to you, that same kind of question to you, Hamid, because you've been CEO for 40 years, as, as we've said. And um, I'd just like to know what you're doing at Prologis to create an environment where people feel comfortable to experiment, to try new ideas. Um, how do you encourage innovation as the leader? Well, I think you stay very curious. You ask a lot of questions. You read voraciously. You learn from other industries. You connect the dot from over there to the dot over there when you know most people uh, see that and see that, but they don't. They can't really link it the two together. So, so those are all the things that a leader does. But at the end of the day, it's all about culture. Our three big things are change, culture, and customers. They all start with C's, and it's easy to remember that way. So, and they all go together. So we talked a lot about the customer aspect. But I don't know how you can serve your customers if you don't have a great culture. When people come to work every day, they're not really happy to be there. You can't do that. Your customers will read that. I mean, we've all been in many airlines. I don't want to pick on airlines where you know that the person that's helping you in that airline is not happy with their job at the moment. So, so you want to build a great culture. And in successful companies like Ted's and ours, uh, there is a propensity to keep going in the same direction. And trying to change direction becomes difficult because people say, well, aren't we like the leader in this business? And why should we change? And aren't we making a lot of money and doing well? Why don't we keep doing what we're doing? And, and usually when you need to change is the time when you feel the least need to change. And that's a really, really uh, important discipline that a leader uh, should always nudge the business forward uh, you get too comfortable, you get killed. So, uh, so um, Andy Grove, many years ago, 20, maybe 30 years ago, wrote a book. I think it was called the, Only the Paranoid Survive. Right. The best business book ever written. You should go read it. Every year you should read it because I think it's so, so true. So, well, anyway. I'd like to get your take, both of you, on being a CEO because, let's face it, it's very tough to be the CEO these days. It's a tough job. I mean, your employees, your customers, your shareholders, even the public have expectations from you guys as CEOs and to have an answer for everything and on social issues uh, too. And uh, Ted, you know, as I said, you've been in the job now two years. Talk to us a little bit about what have been some of the surprises. What are some of the things you're doing as a CEO that you never thought you would be doing? And really from a leadership mindset, less about the task list. You know, how's it been for you? What, what has surprised you? Well, there, there's, on, on the governance piece, there's, there's certainly a lot of, um, you know, distractions and in, in external parties with, with agendas that, you know, don't really have much to do with Home Depot. They're just, they're just using us as, as, as well as others. And we, we just have to, you have to stick to, to your goals, your vision, your mission. And, you know, I talked about our values wheel and, and, and my favorite value is doing the right thing. And in, you know, one of my, my favorite adages of how to live life is, you know, actions speak louder than words. So we don't want to get into the word game and press release game. And, in you know, my personal views, I don't think have, have a lot to do with, with running a business. I do the right thing by the customer and the associate. And um, Home Depot has an incredibly strong culture and value system from day one. And we focus on that and we do the right thing and we give back and we take care of our associates and we take care of our communities and our shareholders. And you know, it, it is a, a stakeholder vision that we've, we've had for some time. 
And we just keep executing and living those values and in, in, in taking those actions. And I think in the long run, you know, all these tides of, that we're dealing with will will come and go, but but the strong companies that, that truly have missions and values and purposes and don't just just um, talk the talk, but they walk the walk are the ones the ones that excel in, in that zone depot. Well, one of the controversial topics that every CEO, no matter what kind of company they are, big or small, is dealing with the workplace. And we're gonna have a panel coming up and that's in depth, but I just want to ask one or two questions uh, to the, from the two of you is that uh, CEOs now are making uh, new demands on the return to office uh, saga. Employees have their own demands on all of this. Hamid, how, where do you stand on all of this? What are you telling your employees about the pros and cons of a hybrid workforce versus coming into the office? I think ours is an apprenticeship business. And I want you to put this in the context of everything we're talking about, groundbreakers. I mean, right. we're, we're really shaping now the future of the workplace, and the workplace is where we're gonna get all of this innovation and, and change, right? Right. I think the workplace was too rigid before the pandemic. This idea, this notion of nine to five every day, chain to your desk, given the communication tools that are available to us, the fact that people are on 24 seven or everywhere other than Europe, they're on 24 um, seven. You know, the, um, so all of those things have really changed the world in the last 20 or 30 years. So, um, you know, by definition, we need to recognize that. And the pandemic just accelerated that realization. So we need to be more flexible than we have been. I think we were too flexible because we had to during COVID. And I fear that the young people that are just coming into the for workforce are not getting the same benefit of mentorship right. and apprenticeship than they were getting in times past and in mm -hmm. times future. And I hope they'll make a special effort to get that because I think that's the only way they'll learn mm -hmm. and they'll succeed. So I think that we need to find the right balance and the right balance will differ for every company. Ted can't have his associates be work from home because he's not selling two by fours from, from, uh, from the house. You know, they gotta show up to the store and they gotta serve their customers. There are aspects of our business where you can do your job pretty well from home and you need to just come to the office once in a while to maintain that connectivity with your colleagues and all right. that. But, but most of our positions that have to do with deal making, leasing, acquisitions, development. We're in the people business, and I don't know how you do that by remote control. Or, Ted, uh, you know, I'd like to get your thoughts on this because I've been hearing from a lot of business leaders who are kind of worried about um, this hybrid formula, the impact it's having on productivity, uh, creating a culture of collaboration, which is really important, and innovation. You know, what's, what's your thought on this? What are you doing at Home Depot? So very much aligned with, with what Hamid said, it, we were too rigid um, pre-pandemic. The, the technologies thankfully kind of came together, you know, right, right when, when, when the, um, the pandemic hit. Look what we're doing today. I, you know, I couldn't get across the country and I think this is working. Um, it, so it, it's amazing what these technologies are doing and you need to leverage those for productivity and in, in, in work-life balance. But at the end of the day, I talked about our inverted pyramid in, in the customer and the associates in the front line are at, t at the top of the pyramid and we're the store support center and our culture is so strong in, in apprenticeship of, of, of younger younger workers. It's very, very important to, to be in person, but you do have to recognize that there, there are you know, certain disciplines, um, tech engineers, for example, that you know for right now that Force is essentially bolted, and that is an, an independent workforce. Um, but every company is going to have to work their way through this. We're in the store support center, largely back, um, you know, three, four days a week. And if someone had told me um, 30 years ago that I could have a Friday, my choice, I, I'd say they. I'm like, what? Well, what are you talking about? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. But now it, it works for us. And um, it's, um, it's a tricky one. In, in the younger generations, I was just down at a university and I asked a, a group of, of seniors how many of them wanted to work full time in the office, no hands went up. How many wanted to work a mix, 
almost every hand went up and how many wanted 100% independent and only one hand went up. So I think our, our young um, emerging graduates are, are saying the same thing. They, they want to mix, they understand how important the human connection is and every company is just going to have to get that balance right for themselves. Well, as we wrap up here, I'm going to let you have the last word. Um, we, I would like to get, you're so good on giving advice. And what's the advice you have that makes a successful leader in this time that we're going through where we've been talking this morning about massive innovation, re revolutionizing things like AI? And you know, what do you say to CEOs of what's the best way to lead, especially at a time where there's so many changes coming on with technology? Last word, Hamid. I think the most important characteristic of a C for a CEO is to make uh, clarity out of chaos. And there's a lot of facts coming at us every day. There's lots of information. And the skill that is becoming scarcer and scarcer is the ability to sort through it all, figure out what's important, what's, affecting, what's gonna affect your business and in what direction, and then get the appropriate input, but be decisive. You can't run a company or any organization by a committee, somebody's gotta make the decision, but you gotta get all the appropriate input and you gotta stay curious to look at and see, consider all different points of view. Thank you very much for that. Ted, thank you so much for being with us. Hamid, this has been a great uh, conversation. Thank you both. A nice way to kick off our day.